Okay, um, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 2023 Constitutional Court Recruitment live stream. Um, I see we already have some people joining us. Um, just to firstly introduce the purpose of this meeting. Um, this meeting is to give a background and framework for the Constitutional Court of South Africa's law clerkship program and address some questions which applicants might have regarding the application process and the job in general. Um, so to begin the live stream, I think I'm just going to invite my colleagues to introduce themselves in turn. Um, so Nikita, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Nikita Thilangi. I'm clerking for Justice the Ron. Before this, I was doing articles at Bowman's. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Kira Quinn. I'm currently clerking for Judge Madlanga. And before this, I was doing my articles at CDH. And hello, everyone. My name is Kudzaishi Mukunga. I'm currently clerking for Justice Colopin as a foreign clerk. And before this, I've, I was completing my undergraduate LLB studies at the University of Cape Town. So um, we're going to discuss a number of aspects, but to begin with, I'll just give an introduction to the Constitutional Court and the clerkship program and also the application program. So at the Constitutional Court of South Africa, as many of you may already know, this is the apex court in South Africa's judicial system. Um, we have 11 justices, and we are currently sitting in the courtroom at Constitutional Hill, and behind us would be where the justices would sit on an ordinary hearing day. So each just, justice of the Constitutional Court has about or a minimum of two law clerks who assist them with research and other matters in fulfilling their duties as um, judges of this court. <clears throat> and the law clerks are usually... Um, law or are required to be law graduates and they have varying degrees of experience and they work um, within different chambers for the different judges carrying out various tasks which shall be discussed later on in this discussion. So appointments are made for law clerks on an annual basis um, for two intakes. So there's firstly a January intake and a June intake and the maximum period for the law clerkship mm -hmm. is one year. This is subject to change in exceptional circumstances, but generally this is a fixed term one year clerkship. In the case of foreign clerks, foreign clerks work for six months, but again, this is subject to change um, either upwards or downwards. Um, the judges work very closely with their individual clerks. So although there are some general entry requirements, which we will discuss, um, judges might have specific preferences for different people with different um, backgrounds or different experience levels. Um, but generally, the estimated timeline is at the end of March, you submit your application for the clerkship program. Foreign clerkship applications are accepted on a rolling basis, and thereafter, um, the applications will be shortlisted. Candidates will be invited to interview with the justices, and if they are successful, they will be contacted by um, the Constitutional Court um, to either undertake their clerkship in January or June of the preceding year. So that's just a general overview of the clerkship program. Kira, would you like to discuss what applicants must submit? Yeah, so I'm going to talk about what your application will need to contain. Um, like most applications for uh, legal jobs, you'll need a cover letter, which just explains who you are, why you would like to clerk at the court, um, a CV that's updated up to date with all of your recent experience. You need a copy of your ID, um, a copy of all of your qualifications. You need three recommendation letters, um, an example of your written, a piece of written work that can show your ability to write and research. Um, yeah, your uh, qualifications must be uh, certified. And if you are in possession of a foreign qualification, it's your responsibility to get that certified too. Failure to submit all of these um, will mean that your application will not be taken into account. So please do go through the list very carefully and make sure you submit everything. Uh, one last thing, you also need to include a Z83 form, which you can find on the website. Um, that's a one pager that you'll just fill out. Um, like could I said, you can either clerk from January to December or you can clerk from July to June the next year. So it's important to 
indicate to which period you would prefer or which period you're available for um, if you're only available for one of those periods. Um, the foreign clerk applications are a little bit different. As could I said, those are um, those come in on a rolling basis and they are looked at as and when they come in. Um, once you've completed your application and you have together these documents, you will then email those to applications at concourt.org.za. Um, you can also post your application, but I think it's a lot easier to just email that through. Um, HR will be in touch with those of you who then do get an interview with one of the judges or two or three of the judges. You will not be contacted if your application is not successful. So just yeah, bear that in mind. Um, interviews are held either in person or on Zoom, depending on the judge's preference. I think most of the judges are conducting their interviews in person now, but there they can be arrangements made if, for example, you're not in the country. Um, yeah, it's a one-year contract. Um, and yeah, Nikita is going to take you through some of the personal and professional traits that the different judges look for in, in applicants. So I think depending on your chamber, what your judge is looking for will be very dependent on that specific judge. Um, all the judges are very, very different. But having said this, there are some common personality traits or professional traits that are applicable to all law clerks. The first is, I would say, our work ethic and ability to work under pressure, um, especially during term. There's quite a lot of pressure on law clerks to provide a supportive role to judges. Um, we do tend to work quite long hours, so you need to be able to be willing to do this. Um, given the nature of the work, um, there's a, you need to have a respect for confidentiality um, and the law. You also have to have strong research abilities because a large part of our role is research orientated. Um, you need to have good writing and research and oral abilities in English and you need to be able to multitask. Um, and generally, a large part of your work will be group work. So you need to be able to work well in a group and have an attitude that reflects this. OK, so I think the three of us are just going to talk a little bit about our life as a law clerk thus far. And I see we do have a couple questions that are popping up um, on the chat. So after we um, finish telling you about life as a law clerk, we will consider each of these questions. So if you have posted one, we do know and we will attend to that soon. Um, could I would like to start? Okay, um, and I think perhaps in describing my life as a law clerk um, a little bit, I'll address some of the questions which tie into that aspect of the presentation. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning of this discussion, I am a foreign clerk for Justice Colopin. But the foreign clerkship mirrors very similarly the local clerkship in that we perform the same duties, we have the same responsibilities with a few differences. So for example, um, the foreign clerkship is not a contract of employment, um, it's a volunteer post, so it's unremunerated and you have to um, make your own arrangements for funding. Another difference between the foreign clerkship and the local clerkship is that um, it's not a one-year post, it is a six-month post on average. However, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is also subject to change. But other than that, to answer the question of what is it, it's substantially similar to the local clerkship. Um, and some of our duties day-to-day -day during term time is assisting our judges with researching and preparing for hearings, which um, are scheduled for the term time. And um, also participating in other clerks committees um, which the court is responsible for. Um, I don't know, Kira or Nikita, would you like to add on to um, life as a law clerk? Um, I'd like to say that it's very chamber specific, so it depends um, what judge chooses you to be their clerk. Um, some judges require more mm. research orientated tasks, some judges require more um, 
administrative um, assistance. So it really depends on who you get and who your co-clerks are to, because you know you can use your different skills and basically um, collaborate to to make a the working environment um, easier for all of you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Nikita said it is long hours. Um, it's a wonderful experience. It's a wonderful opportunity. You get to sit here with your judges, learn from them, have discussions with them. You create wonderful relationships with the other clerks um, in the clock body. But it is a very demanding job. And so just keep that in mind when you do apply. I would encourage everyone to apply. But yeah, it's it's a it's a tough year. And the expectations are very high. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And perhaps, perhaps if I could pose this question to you both, um, both of you have background working in commercial practice as um, candidate attorneys, um, and you could maybe suggest or describe how that differs to the clerkship in the day-to-day -day roles. I know from my perspective coming out of university, it is very research-based and a bit of um, <clears throat> drafting in some instances, but how would that differ from working in commercial practice? Yeah, so I don't know if Nikita will have the same experience as me, but I've done a lot more substantive type work yes. in this role um, than as an article clerk. Um, you work very closely with your judge, um, which is dissimilar to how you would work with a partner, with a partner or a senior associate or something like mm. that. Um, a lot less printing and paginating <laughs> making and files. making files. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, as I said, it is chamber specific. So it will definitely be substantive work. It's amazing exposure, whatever judge you get, if you're lucky enough to get the position. Um, but yeah, I'd say that's the main the main difference that I've found. I would also say that it's a lot more group work. Um, mm -hmm. You work in a team, in a chamber, in a, in a much more collaborative way than you would as an article clerk. Um, you get instructions that you share in the chamber as opposed to to you being responsible for that specific instruction. Yeah. Um, that's a big difference. Mm. Agreed. Yeah, and I suppose perhaps to add on that, we have um, expressed how much you work closely with your judge, but you also work very closely with your chamber mates, mm. the other law clerks, and also the wider clerk body. You, collab you collaborate on a few um, projects quite regularly, and it's an opportunity to learn from your workmates. Everyone has mm varying degrees of work experience and varying backgrounds. And I think that's quite beneficial to create a space where you can learn from each other and you know develop your interests. Yeah, agreed. Um, so I see we have a question or we have some of the questions and I think it might be a good idea to start addressing them in the presentation. So um, we have discussed that um, the justices have different preferences and different um, requirements. But one of the questions, and perhaps two questions which are linked to each other, do I need an LLB degree to be a law clerk? And is there an academic base average which I need to have obtained to qualify for the clerkship program? So um, with regard to the first question, you do need an LLB. You need to have completed your LLB by the time the clerkship starts. So I see there's also another question that is, do you have to have completed your LLB or can the court accept you in your final year or your penultimate year? Um, yes, you can apply in your final year. Um, the requirement is merely that you have obtained your LLB by the, the start date of your, your clerkship stint. Um, with regard to whether you need a certain average, um, some judges look at academics more than others. Um, and I would say it's obviously um, preferential to have good marks, but no, there's not a um, an average that is required to apply. So I would encourage everyone to apply if you if you think you'll love the job, if you think you have experience um, that puts you in a good position to apply for the job. I would say go for it, but you do need an LLB. Okay, and perhaps to add to that question, I saw. Um, in previous years, um, candidates had asked, is a BCom law or a BA law sufficient to apply for the clerkship? But I believe that the practice is you must have completed an LLB. So at some institutions, you do a BCom law and then you do an additional two years to obtain the LLB degree. So you must have either completed your LLB degree or 
by at the time of applying or by the time the clerkship begins, you must have completed your LLB degree. Um, another question we have perhaps on the academic aspect of the clerkship, um, should I submit a marked assignment or write something new for the writing um, sample component of the application? Do you want to take this one, Nikita? I submitted a marked assignment. In my final year at UCT, we did like mini theses. So that's the written piece I submitted. I don't think it matters. I think what um, Kira would know because she's been through recruitment, but I think what is important is that it shows your analytical ability and your uh, like ability to legally reason. Um, and that's really what people are looking for in, in that written piece. So you're welcome to write something new. Um, it was just convenient that I had a piece in my bank that I could use. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I think either just um, if you have a piece that exists and it's maybe too long or too short, you can always tailor that piece to um, to suit your application. Kira, do you think it matters that it's a piece that reflects an area of law that you're particularly passionate about? I think it's always helpful to have a piece that you've put your, your heart and mm. your mind into. So I think in that respect, the pieces that come from you in a area of law that you're passionate about are usually better. But here at the court, we hear many matters. Um, you know, it's not just constitutional matters. It's not just human rights matters. So any area of law mm. is, is perfectly fine. Um, I um, think as long as you, you really put your, your best foot forward in that yeah. piece, it doesn't matter what area of law it covers. My piece particularly wasn't very legal focused as well. Um, so it was more humanities centric and that was accepted. So it doesn't actually have to be. No, it doesn't. I think it just oh. does need to show your legal your reasoning. ability to write and your ability to reason. Mm. Mm. Agreed. I agree. And this obviously isn't a requirement, but something I've heard um, in speaking to other people, some people will take a particular interest in the case before the court. Um, either where a judgment is pending or where a hearing has recently occurred and they'll put pen to paper and write their thoughts on such case or perhaps a previous judgment of the court. And I think that's a great way to demonstrate mm -hmm. your interest in the work of the court and, you know, some of the constitutional issues which come before the court. Yeah. Um, I think I've seen quite an interesting question in the chat. I don't know, it's a bit difficult at the same time. Someone asks, tell me about yourselves, your backgrounds, and why do you believe you were chosen for the clerkship? Um, would we like to address those questions and give a bit more background? Um, so, my background, as I said, I did my articles at TDH. Prior to that, I did a master's overseas. Um, and before that, I was doing my BA law and then LLB um, at the University of Pretoria. So that's sort of the, the academic background. Um, I think the clerkship, in terms of personal background, you get a whole mix here. I'm from Johannesburg, but there are people here who are from all over the country, um, a range of different universities, and have a range of different experiences. It's not a requirement that you've done your articles before. A couple of us have, but many people haven't. Um, and I think why I was chosen, I mean, I couldn't give you a perfect answer, um, but I was, I interviewed for the first time and didn't get in and only on the second time I got in. So I think it's also important to, to know that you might not get in on the first time and, and the second time or the third or the fourth time you might get in. And so if this job is something that you really want, um, don't get disheartened if you don't get in on try one. Um, and yeah, I think I'd, I'd put together a good application. Um, I had good academic results and I completed articles. And so I think as long as you've built up some type of experience, it doesn't necessarily have to be articles. Um, but yeah, just demonstrating in your application that you really want the job and that you will be able to um, take the pressure of the job, work in a team, work hard, um, <coughs> commit your 
nights and your weekends sometimes when you don't feel like it <laughs> so um yeah that's as much as i can say on my side but i think as we said a lot of the the judges are very different in what they look for um and so you know put your best foot forward but also just be yourself because the judges um yeah they have they have different um wants and needs for their chamber and I think to add on to what you said, if you look at the current Clark body, everyone is incredibly different. And so it's very difficult to say that there's something that the judges are specifically looking mm. for. Mm. Yeah, I think it's impossible to say that actually. Yeah. Mm. Um, perhaps for me to answer this question, my background, I've just completed my four year undergraduate at LB at the University of Cape Town. Before that, I was living and a student again in Harare, Zimbabwe, and why I studied law and why I pursued the constitutional court clerkship. I was always interested in economics and history, and I think law is something which marries those two things, and especially I have a lot of respect for the constitutional court of South Africa, and I, I, I guess it's always a historical process looking at the law, looking at how it should develop and how um, it should be applied when it affects people's lives. And I, I think we have discussed how everyone has different experience levels. Although I didn't have professional work experience in the strict sense, I think I took lots of opportunities whilst I was at university outside of the classroom to develop my interests in law and try and expose myself to legal practice, um, both in South Africa and maybe even in the global sphere. So with mood competitions, where I got exposure to different areas of law, um, international commercial arbitration, um, and also taking opportunities to lead through university. So I think this is to say, if you are a university student, whether you are at the start of your degree or towards the tail end of your degree, you can harness all of those experiences to demonstrate in your application why you think you'd be a good pick for the Concord. And um, just demonstrating your passion, how you kind of invested in your interest in the law and maybe constitutional law or law more generally, and how those experiences will bring value to the um, to the court body, to the clerkship body, and to your work as a clerk. Um, what else can I say? And I suppose um, drawing on my experience and speaking to a question which I saw about whether one can submit a marked assignment or write something new again, I went the route of submitting a marked university assignment so I'd recently written on criminal law and some developments I thought were necessary in criminal law and which I was passionate about. And that also corresponded to um, a similar matter, which was before the court. So I kind of used that as an opportunity to demonstrate my writing skills and my interest in criminal law and my interest in what was before the court at that time. Um, so I think that's what I can say about my personal background. Um, and perhaps also drawing on my personal background and answering a question which has been raised to me um, personally. Um, although I studied in South Africa and I completed my LLB degree in South Africa, I'd still qualify as a foreign clerk because that is qualified based on your citizenship status as opposed to where you have studied and lived. So even if you've grown up in South Africa and perhaps you're not yet a permanent resident, um, you could still apply for the clerkship as a foreign clerk and go through those processes. Um, so yeah, that's a bit about my personal background. Nikita, would you like to speak to yours? Mine is very similar to Kira's with the exception that I didn't do a cool master's. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did a BA in law. Um, I did history and law as my two majors at UCT. Um, and then I did two years of articles at Bowman's. Um, I've always wanted to apply to the court. I applied for the first time and got in but having said that i think you can apply many times and you might get in on like your eighth try and that's totally feasible <laughs> um, um i think why i was chosen i did well in university uh bowman's gave me great work experience um in a very time pressured and difficult environment um and I would say my interview went well. I clicked with the judge. I was comfortable and I was myself. And I think that was probably what I felt was the most positive in my recruitment process. Um, I think, we, yeah, I, I also thought about when applying, what are they looking for? And how can I fit my, like make myself fit that? And I think that's probably the wrong way to go about it. You should just be yourself. And if you make 
if you're a good fit for the chamber, then you're a good fit for the chamber. And it's very difficult to know that going in. So you might as well just you know, be yourself on paper and in person and you are more likely to get in. <laughs> so I see there's a question about cover letter length. Um, there's no strict um, guidelines as to how long a cover letter should be. But I think a shorter cover letter is always better than a longer cover letter, max two pages. Yeah. Um, and another question was, what do you include in that? Um, who you are, what you've done so far that um, will help you to be able to fulfill the job and why you want the job and why yeah. you, well, you, you'll be good at the job. Yeah, I think those are the two um, things. Those are the main things. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't go into any detail about, I mean, if there's something you've done in your career that you're really passionate about or things like that, but I wouldn't go into detail about a piece of written work or mm. um, something too academic or too mm. um, experience orientated. I would speak about yeah, who you are, why you want to be here. Okay. Um, and then, sorry, there was um, also a question about age. Yes. Um, yes. I think there is a range of ages. A definite range. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I don't. You might be one of the youngest. Yes. Yeah. Um, so it yeah it ranges from straight out of university to been working for several years. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think last year there was um, a woman in her late thirties. Um, so when whenever you think that it's a good time in your career, I think is perfectly fine. Is there's no ideal age. Mm. I agree. I agree. And even now, I think we do have people on a wide spectrum yes. of the age or like, you know, and we all interact with each other and respect each other and we bring different things to the table. And I think I would definitely encourage someone to apply if you're 35 or, yeah. Mm. Um, another question we have is, can you describe the training and professional development opportunities at the court? <laughs> I would say in an informal sense, there's a huge amount of growth that can take place. You learn more than you learn in most other jobs. It's, it's kind of packed into that year and it's quite intense. Um, you're developing different skills all the time. In a formal way, I would say there's nothing. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's not really any you know, professional courses or, or things like that that you can do um, through the Office of the Chief Justice. So I'd say professionally, um, you learn a huge amount, um, but it's not it's not in the formal developmental sense, if that is what, what the question was aimed at. Mm. But in an informal sense, there's a handover from your previous clerks to your incoming clerks, and that's sort of your training process. So everything you do for the first time the clerk that's already in the chamber is going to introduce you on how to do that. And it's, yeah, it works really well. Yeah, and there's an orientation period um, at the beginning of each uh, clerkship stint. Mm -hmm. So uh, you aren't completely uh, thrown into, into the deep end. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a, a training system, quite informal, but it is there. Mm -hmm. And I think I suppose there is benefit in learning things as you go because some things you can't have them all dumped on you in the beginning and mm. like remember them as you go throughout. But I suppose a benefit of the two intakes of the constitutional court that you have some people who begin in January and some people who begin in June, you always have a chambermate who has been there a bit longer than you and you can always consult them and learn different things from them and their experiences. And I think that's very beneficial. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another question we have is, can we describe the work environment, culture and community at the court? And I suppose linked to that question is interactions between law clerks and the justices of the court. <clears throat> Want to start? I think on a clerk to clerk level, it's very collaborative. We work together almost every day. Um, and that, that's not just within your chamber, you work with um, other chambers in getting out judgments and checking out each other's work. Um, with the judges, it's very dependent on the judge and chamber. Um, 
but it, you work very closely with the judge. You get to know them incredibly well. You understand exactly what their expectations are of you. And it's it's a very, I found it's a very like helping environment, supportive. Judges really look at your opinions and they value them and they consider them. Um, and you do feel very important and like you are making a really valuable contribution to the jurisprudence of the court um, because you are very heavily relied upon, um, which is something that was surprising and uh, quite like extraordinary for me is that, yeah, that we play such a huge role in, in the court's process. Mm. Yeah. The work environment is extremely collegial. I think <laughs> I've used the phrase colleagues quite frequently working here, <laughs> but it does. Um, I think it is a very friendly and welcoming, welcoming environment. And I suppose given that um, different chambers have different um, clerks and different personalities, you are also somewhat responsible for setting the mood and like um, shaping the culture within your chambers and like within your, your clerk body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if we can add anything on that question, but um, perhaps moving to the more technical questions about the application process, we have a question, how many clerks are appointed each year approximately? So it varies, but I'd say about 20, mm. um, maybe mm. more. Yeah, I think this year it is closer to 30. Yeah. Um, and I think additionally um or what, what i've heard with this year is quite a few of the chambers have three, three. clerks mm. um, as opposed to two yeah so maybe yeah. i'd say between 22 and 30 mm. yeah um every year each judge always has two um the chief justice usually has three the deputy chief justice usually has three and then sometimes other judges will have three depending on foreign clerkship posts or um yeah acting positions so it varies but um that's the range okay and then we have a question is it preferable for me to hand deliver my application or submit it via email i would say via email should suffice yeah i don't see i, I suppose perhaps if you have challenges technically submitting your email via email your application via email, it might be preferable to hand deliver the application. Mm. But I think submitting it via email, mm. you shouldn't be concerned about it not getting through or being received by the relevant people. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I think email is probably preferable. Mm. And then we have a question on reference letters. With regard to the three reference letters, which letters would be recommended we submit from a lecturer or a former boss or a firm where you did back work? I think this question, it depends on your personal experiences with these different people and who you think would speak best to your capabilities and your um, qualifiedness for the foreign, for the clerkship position. And I think something which I learned um, during university applying for different things is um, <clears throat> sometimes it's not best to necessarily choose the biggest name or the name which you think will carry the most weight because mm -hmm. that person might not be the best placed individual to give you a strong reference letters. Mm. I think a reference, a good reference letter is more important, or again, something I've learned, a good reference letter is more important than a reference letter who has come from someone who you'd consider more influential. Mm. So I think the more personal relationships you have with people, the good impressions you've made on people, and they're in a position and they're willing to write your very strong reference letter, that's what you should use to determine yeah. who you select to write your reference letter. Yeah, and I think in this position, um, there's not more weight put on, for example, an academic reference as opposed to a professional reference. Both of those um, are perfectly workable. Um, so as could I said, just a person who can really speak to how you would bring value to the court. Mm. And another question we have, do you select the judge you'd like to work for? Um, the answer to that is no. You submit your application through a central application system to the Constitutional Court. Thereafter, they are shortlisted um, through a first stage process, so I think perhaps two um, preliminary processes. And thereafter, the justices um, shortlist candidates for interviews. And then based on their preference, they will um, indicate which individuals they'd like to clerk in their chambers. And I think it's also not advisable for you to include in your application that you have a preference for a certain judge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
And then let's just have a look at the chat. Would you say this role is mostly for extroverted LLB graduates or introverted LLB graduates? <laughs> I think either. Um, Definitely. There's extroverts and introverts here. And I think both types of people have been great at the job and added different things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, just be yourself. Yeah. And who you are will fit into a certain chamber a certain chamber or you know you'll play a certain role within the body of clerks um and then this is also like a personal question what were your reasons for applying for the clerkship um i think nikita touched on this saying um you had wanted to apply for a long time i think i was similar um it's a wonderful year to do um i think especially when you when you're starting out because there's such a large amount of exposure to different cases you can really figure out what type of law you like um and where you want to go after this it's also amazing for connections mm -hmm. so you get to know other clerks who who are young and vibrant and um yeah want to do similar things with their career of course, engaging with the judges is um, a huge bonus. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's just a really great job to have. And I think um, I would encourage anyone to apply. Um, but yeah, I think the exposure for me was the, was the main pull. Mm -hmm. um, I think my reasons for applying, I did have a keen interest in constitutional law. Um, and from a substantive aspect, I was really interested in researching further. And I thought this was just an incredible opportunity to learn um, to learn from the lawyers who appear before the Constitutional Court. So I think I mentioned earlier, I'm really interested in mooting and oral advocacy. And I think being a clerk at the court, not only do you learn from your colleagues and the justices of the court, but you also learn um, a little bit of technique and about the law from the advocates who appear mm -hmm. before the court. They are like really high caliber um, practitioners who appear before this court. And then a more um, or less sophisticated reason <laughs> for me applying was because my options as a foreign clerk were limited um, in terms of practicing or pursuing the articles route. So I thought this opportunity would fit nicely for me in developing my legal skills without necessarily having to jump through hoops or, you know, make a precise decision about what I would do after university. Um, and then someone asked if I did a BA prior to the LLB. I did not. Um, and that was a bit of information failure. I think studying in Zim, I didn't realize the differences between the BA law, like very um, properly and the LLB. So I did not do that. Um, Nikita, do you have anything to add? I think the other drawing factor for me was the diverse education. I think just the nature of the court that is we hear matters in all areas of law, and that's incredibly exciting and engaging because every day you're doing something completely different and something new, and that's not always available to you in practice. Mm. So to the extent that we are allowed to do that, and yeah, you really test your brain and your critical reasoning. I think that was one of my drawing factors as well. Yeah. Certainly. And now we have a question on the interviews. Um, so any interview tips you'd like to share or how you're, or I suppose also linked to this question, I like merging things, is can you be called for more than one interview with more than one judge at the court? Yeah, so um, yes, you can. You can get multiple interviews depending on which judges like your application and want to chat to you further. Um, so that's possible and the the HR will make sure that there's no clashes and things like that. So, so don't worry about that. Um, tips, I would say try, get to grips with a little bit of the jurisprudence of the court, read a couple cases, um, especially cases that are written by the judge that you're gonna be interviewing with. Um, yeah, try to be a little bit relaxed, um, not not too mm. nervous, but I know that that's, that's a hard task when you're walking into the chambers of a whole constitutional court judge. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, know your CV, be able to talk about um, things that you put on your CV, mm. be able to talk about 
um, things that you put in your cover letter, why you want the job, why you think you would be good at the job. Um, and maybe why you want to clock for that specific judge. Yeah. Mm. That's a good question to prepare for. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's mm. what I can think of. I think in preparing for my interviews, another thing I did is I watched all of the JSC interviews. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I think it was helpful because I got exposure to the kind of um, judge I was meeting. So it felt a bit less daunting when mm. I met them in the interview, having seen them um, talking in the JSC interviews. And it gave me a bit more insight into their personal backgrounds and their professional backgrounds. And it gave me something to relate to a bit more than just mm. like a write up on the judge. So mm. that was very helpful. And I also tried to look at um, some of the judgments they'd written or some of the their key famous judgments, just to have an idea of um, where they stood on certain legal matters and their thinking and their reasoning. And it was an opportunity to sort of draw on their experiences and my experiences. So like I mentioned earlier, um, my writing sample was on a criminal law matter and something which was before the court or I had interests in educational policy. So I could kind of relate with the judges based on what they've written and their judgments and then what I had submitted and some of the things I'd thought about during university. Um, another interview tip, don't overthink it too much. Like try going to things relaxed. I know mm. it's hard to say um, if you have a morning interview, you might be up all night thinking about it, but it is important to have like rested properly and you know to just be composed and you know speak slowly when you get into there like mm. make sure that you present yourself clearly mm. and nothing is lost in translation um another interview tip which i did was i looked at some youtube videos on how to prepare for interviews um i did look at some commercial law firm interview tip videos but i think they were still helpful just as mm. someone who had very little experience interviewing for professional positions um, so yeah, that's what I can think of. Mm. I see there is one question about whether someone can be called for more than one interview. I think we touched on that, yes, you can. And also there's only one round of interviews. So you interview with one judge or more than one judge, but only once, and then you will know whether you got it or not. There's mm -hmm. not rounds and psychometrics and tests and things like that. Like they are in the more corporate positions and then we have another question which is again a bit more on the technical aspects of the application is it preferable for me to submit one consolidated application and the answer to that is yes you have to submit several documents and they could be lost or you know it might you know just like fall by the wayside if you submit multiple attachments so i think it is preferable to consolidate everything into one PDF and send that off to the court when you send your application. And earlier, I also saw a question asking about a link to the application process. So if you go onto the Constitutional Court website, you will see the advert for the Law mm. Club program. And it's not an online application process where you submit your documents through a portal. You have to email all of your documents to the email address, which is listed on that application um, advert. Uh, it's also on Twitter. Yes. You can't find it on the website. Yes, that's correct. And if you um, found out about this information session through your university institution, the advert would have also been included mm. in mm. that email. Um, and then another question. Um, one of the viewers believes that the question on age was not sufficiently addressed. And they've said that 35 is a bit limiting. So I think we weren't trying to say 35 is the maximum age which you can apply to the court. It's just that the individual who had asked the question had said, I'm 35 years old, should I apply to the court? And the question would, of course, be yes. Everyone has a different um, path to life, if I can say that. I know some of our parents are going back to university at this age, and they would only be ready to begin like job searching or work experience in their 40s or in their 50s. And I think that's perfectly acceptable. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of us have studied and worked alongside people who are um, older than us. And it's not a limiting factor at all. It can be extremely beneficial. And I would say that there is probably a track record of the court having older applicants, if we can use that term. Um, and then another personal question, do you find the role rewarding? 
Nikita, do you want to start addressing that question? Oh, incredibly so. I think there's so much about this role that's rewarding. Um, as a law student, you'd look at the Constitutional Court with awe and with critique sometimes, and it's amazing to sit in this building. Um, in and itself, the building's amazing, but to sit in hearings, to watch uh, the judges, who are people we have read for our entire careers, um, ask questions and grill counsel and give their opinions. I think I'm constantly in a state of awe. And I think sometimes when you work as hard as we do, you forget about like the incredible space in which you're working in and the incredible work that you're doing. Um, it's easy to forget sometimes, but you just sort of have to look around this building and realize that you're sitting at the Constitutional Court and it makes it special again. Um, so from that perspective, I'm still kind of in awe constantly, <laughs> <laughs> hasn't completely set it in. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think I think it's completely rewarding. It's totally worth it. I think this will be one of the coolest things I've ever done in my life. So yeah. And I would completely agree with that. I think um, although we have said the role is demanding, it's a good demanding because you enjoy what you do mm. and you kind of are always learning, you're always feeding your brain. And I think as Nikita and Kira both shared, the experience is a bit different when you're in pro professional commercial practice and you're mm. restricted to one area of the law or you're restricted to certain tasks. I think as law clerks, we perform a variety of different tasks which keep us on our toes. Sometimes they're a bit difficult to keep up with, but I think it's great that you develop yourself in several different ways. You yeah. develop your um, argumentative skills, you develop your research skills, you develop your, write, your drafting and writing skills. And I think that's great. And I think it's also great from a perspective of networking again, mm -hmm. just like interacting with so many mm -hmm. different um, super smart, super cool clerks. And I think that's very enjoyable and rewarding. Um, and again, also just having that relationship with the different justices of the court is incredible. Yeah. I think it's a huge confidence booster mm -hmm. to work the court because you're presenting your ideas to a judge of the constitutional court. And that gives you, for me personally, gave me a lot of confidence to sort of articulate my own thoughts and opinions. Um, mm -hmm. That's been very rewarding for me. Yeah. And then if we could move on to another question. But before we do so, I would just suggest that we perhaps um, invite questions for the next 10 minutes and then at maybe five, sorry, what's 10 minutes? At five o'clock, we stop looking at the chat, but we address all of the questions which have been asked up until five o'clock. So is that it? Six and up until six. Sorry, six sure. o'clock. <laughs> yeah, I think if you have a question, ask now, mm. because we will be wrapping up soon. Yes, yes. Um, so another question, how long do they take to respond to applications? And when can you expect to receive feedback? My personal experience is a bit different just because the foreign clerk application system is a bit different. Um, it doesn't go through as many um, Office of the Chief Justice processes and checks and mm. you know all of those things. So I think I received feedback quite swiftly um, and the interviews occurred quite swiftly. And I think by after applying in March, I think by April or May, I had an offer, but obviously that might also be different based on like the load of the court considering those applications. <laughs> but I think the Yeah, yeah, you were lucky. <laughs> um, so I didn't have that experience. Um, I found out in November that it was starting in January. So my biggest piece of advice is don't be disheartened if you haven't heard anything back because it yeah. doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. um, it's just sometimes the internal processes at the OCJ take quite a while and it's really out of the hands of the court, it's more administrative. So mm -hmm. don't be disheartened if it takes months and months and months. Um, it does not mean anything regarding whether you've been accepted or not. Yeah, so I'd say after the 31st of March, which is the application deadline, you should hear about interviews May, June. Um, and then yeah, same as Nikita. I mean, I got a last minute offer. So I'd say push out to even December um, if you, yeah, if you can. I know you also need to take other jobs and, and sort out your lives, but that is the reality of, of the admin that goes mm -hmm. into putting the office together and judges considering who's going to go where and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, quite takes quite long. Um, what about receiving an interview? Did you also get like a last minute interview invite? 
I think I got like a week's notice. Mm, same. So we also um, be prepared for that. And I think it was June. Mm. Yeah, same. So that's the timeline, but there's not there's not a strict date date by which you will hear a yes or no. Mm. Um, also, if you don't get an interview, you'll never hear anything, which is not wonderful, but that is the reality. Mm. Um, and I suppose, I think sometimes the notice you get for interviews changes a bit. I think I had three days notice for an interview. So you must just bear in mind that you might have to put a few things, personal things aside to prepare for the interview. I have heard that certain judges will ask you to read certain materials mm. and you should just be mentally prepared to have to do extra research and preparation mm. after submitting your application. Um, once again, we got a question regarding whether you can apply to the Concord with a BCom law degree. If that degree is, so for, so say for example, you did a BCom degree and then you did law and you have an LLB degree, then that's fine. But if it is still a BCom law degree, which hasn't um, ended in an LLB degree, you would first need to complete an LLB degree mm -hmm. um, to qualify for the position. And then another technical question, will this um, video be available online? Yes, um, the video will be saved to the Constitutional Court YouTube channel after this interview. If I can call it mm. in. <laughs> <laughs> I think I saw some interview questions. <laughs> Interview. Speaking of interviews, <laughs> how long do the interviews take? I think it's just subject to how the conversation is going mm. with your judge. You I'd know? say average 20 to 30 minutes. Okay. Longer. An hour? I really? think an hour maximum. Yeah. An hour. Okay, well. Did you survive? It's <laughs> <laughs> questionable. <laughs> <laughs> um, the tw 30 minutes sounds right, though. Mm. I think it's dependent on the judge. As yeah, well. yeah, I think um, we yeah, the judges will <laughs> just set aside probably an hour yeah, for each candidate, and an then hour. they might want a buffer zone to discuss. consider you discuss or yeah, yeah. So yeah, and I suppose it also somewhat depends on how much, how detailed you respond to the questions. Yeah. Mm. Um, sometimes you might be a bit nervous and you like rush through things, but try not to. Try just to. Obviously, not like speak incredibly long, but just like take things yeah. at a comfortable pace for you. You don't have to be worried that they're only giving you 15 minutes or something like that, and then you have to be done. And enjoy yeah. enjoy the experience. You get to sit down with a Concord judge, so mm. that's that's very cool. Mm. Um, another, perhaps I'll do some of the more shorter questions to answer before we go into like a bit of the more detailed questions. Um, do you guys work out of office, and if so, under what circumstances? I think it's dependent on your chamber and your preference. You are able to work from home, but it's sometimes just easier to be in court, um, and the resources are just more readily accessible here. Yeah, I would say it also just depends on what your judge likes. Some of the judges come in more than others, and they mm. want you um, around, so it depends. Okay. But prepare for being in office. Yeah. Yeah. You might be required to be in full time. Mm -hmm. um, and then another technical question. How many applications does the court get on average each year? 200? No, way more. Oh. I think last year we had over a thousand. Um, yeah. So that's that was last year. Mm. Um, and then another question, or perhaps we'll link these two questions. Is it okay if a family member gives me a reference letter? Um, I would advise against it. Um, I don't think it's, I mean, the, the judge will still read it. And I think if that is your only option as your third reference letter, put it in as a character reference. Um, but I think it, it, looks better if there's some type of professional or academic link between you and your referee. I agree. You can even get a reference from high school. <coughs> yeah. That's all an academic reference. Yeah. Um, and then another question is some tips for a good motivational letter slash cover letter. Um, I think motivational letters and cover letters are very personal to you and what you've experienced and what you think is important to include in them. But I suppose 
um, when you're writing your motivation cover letter, just keep in mind the purpose of this letter is to demonstrate who you are and why you're qualified for this role and why your experiences have qualified you for this mm. role. And I think something I've learned um, from various mentors and women in different positions like over the years is um, don't undersell yourself. But, you know, like I think women have a tendency to undersell themselves in cover letters and motivational letters. But make sure that the person reading it knows who you are, knows why you want this position and knows why you're qualified for the mm. position, if I can say that. So draw on your different experiences. Obviously, you submit a CV. But I think a motivation letter and a cover letter is an opportunity to flesh that out and give um, the reader a bit more context into mm. who you are and why you'd be a good fit for the position prior to an interview. Because they haven't met you in an interview. So you also have to show a bit of personality, a bit of you know your professional background and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Agreed. Um, do you guys have anything to add on that? Or can we move to the no, next questions? No, I think questions? that's it. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then we have... Uh, will the clerkship decrease the year of articles I have to do to qualify as an attorney? No. Unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> so it it doesn't um yeah, it doesn't go towards your training contract in under the LPC rules. Hmm. Um and then another question. What is the workload like? Um, and having different <laughs> different numbers of clerks in the chambers. Um, so like we said, every chamber has two clerks and um, some chambers have three. Usually that third one is a foreign law clerk, depending on how many foreign law clerks apply. So during COVID, I think there weren't any um, foreign law clerks. And now um, we have a good amount this mm -hmm. year. But I think this is the first year that... Um, that's really picked up again. And the workload is heavy. Um, it's a lot of work. It's a full-time job and often a night job and a weekend job. Um, not always, and in term, things are a lot busier than out of term. So you do get periods within which uh, you have a little bit more time to rest. Um, but I'd say large workload. I would agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I have a bit of a cough. Just choking a bit. Um, and then another question going back to the interviews. Did you have some difficult questions in the interviews? <laughs> I think the answer is yes. I think with all interviews, there might be a few wild cards thrown in there, but you just have to perhaps perfect your interview technique, if that makes sense. Maybe do a few practice interviews, anticipate some of the questions. And if you are faced with an interview question which you deem difficult, I'd say like take a bit of time to mm. ponder it. You can even throw the question back um, at the judge. <laughs> <laughs> Not throw it back and like, you answer it. <laughs> but maybe say, am I understanding this correctly? Or you can say, yes, I hadn't actually qualify. contemplated mm. this, but like my thinking pattern is um, works like that. So I think it's about perfecting your interview yeah. technique when you get difficult questions. And it's perfectly okay not to know the answer to a question. Yeah. I got a question I didn't know the answer to. Mm. And just if you can come up with an answer on your feet or critically apply your mind, mm. and that's fine. Yeah. yeah. And I think with like law in general and legal practice, there are legal questions where there'll be different views. And like, yeah, sometimes there's no like correct answer. So you can just like, as Nikita said, work through mm. things critically and show your reasoning capabilities. Yeah. Um, and then two questions which are linked. Do I need to do well in a constitutional law module to qualify for the role? And do I need to study advanced constitutional law to qualify for the role? So I think, as, as we said before, some of the judges um, look at marks more than others. Mm. Um, but no, there's no requirement to have a distinction in constitutional law or have a extra advanced constitutional law module or anything like that. Mm. I would say it adds to the strength of your application to have a strong academic record. Mm. Um, and that's across the board. Um, yeah, mm. applies to all okay. modules. Um, there's no specific constitutional requirement. I didn't do particularly well in constitutional law. <laughs> Neither did I. <laughs> Neither did I when I did it in second year. But I suppose it's also about perseverance. Yes. Yeah. Um, if you're still passionate about constitutional law, and perhaps although you haven't done well in 
the con law module, you do well in other modules which are linked to constitutional law and you can still demonstrate your interest in the subject and that you're passionate about it, that will be fine. Yeah. And again, how people come in at different very like varying experience levels. Some of your other experience levels might kind of overshadow your, mm. you know, yeah. that thing because it's not just about academic performance, but applications are considered quite holistically. Yeah. And mm. I think, you know, that that would help. Mm. Um, and then <clears throat> another question, are there opportunities to further my studies during the clerkship by doing an LLM? I understand that some people have done part-time LLMs while working at the court, but I think that would be something you need to discuss with your judge beforehand. Yeah. And you just have to bear in mind that it's extremely, the job is demanding as is. Yeah. So you may not be able to pay as much attention to your LLM studies yeah. whilst doing that. I wouldn't advise it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know some clerks who have done it and made arrangements with, made arrangements with the particular judge. Mm. Um, but I think you can't fully focus on, on this job and then you also can't fully focus on your LLM. And I think it might not be a year in which to take up further studies. Mm. And linked to that question, studying further, I believe after the court abroad, and there are some scholarship opportunities mm. for past clerks at the court yeah. with the Constitutional Court Trust mm. and information about that is available on the Constitutional Court website, I believe. Yeah. Um, and then we have a question. I think these, okay, there's also a question on the remuneration of clerks. Um, I think that information is available on the advert yeah, for the clerkship. You get quite a clear picture of what you can expect. Um, and then we have some questions which I suppose need us to provide some opinion as well. Um, how do you know if you're qualified for the role or not? And which candidates do you think stand the best chance of being selected for the position? These are quite difficult questions to answer. So I think we've answered them a, a little bit in other mm. questions. Um, like we said before, it depends on what judge is looking at your application, but I'd say a strong academic record, um, professional, some professional experience, whether that's articles or in an NGO or- It's helpful. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's helpful. I mean, I think that strengthens your application. It's not a prerequisite. Mm. Um, yeah, a passion for law, social justice. Um, ability to work in a team and if you have like experience that shows that ability mm. that's always helpful um what else yeah i think oh, your reference letters are important because yeah. those those are people who can speak to your your commitment to law to jobs that you've previously held um commitment in an academic sense i think something that also came up in my interview was commitment to the job I think if you can indicate that you're willing to work very hard, um, you know, sacrifice maybe some of your personal life or the hours and the workload, that's always very attractive to a judge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have some questions which are recurring questions, um, such as the duration of the clerkship and the difference between the clerkship and working as an attorney. Um, those questions were addressed earlier on in the live stream, and I would just recommend um, perhaps if you weren't able to join from the beginning, just like watching back yeah. um, the live stream up until the point where you were able to join and those questions will be answered. Um, <clears throat> I don't believe we have any new questions which have not yet been addressed. Um, yeah. The age question has come ag up again. <laughs> um, just to say, no, there is no age cap on clerks at the court. We were just having a discussion from individuals wondering whether they should apply at this old age. Not, <laughs> not that 35 is super old, but I think we did just say we'd encourage anyone to apply at any stage in life. And we do have a wide age range of clerks at the court. Um, yes, no, there is no age limit. Um, and then perhaps this will be the last question we address. Mm. Does the Constitutional Court retain some of their clerks once the contract has ended? No, there's no um, option for retention. It's a it's a one year position. It's not a permanent position. Um, so, yeah, mm. it doesn't operate like law firms where there's a possibility of retention. 
Okay. Um, so I see, okay, I'll indulge this final, final question. Question, how many positions are available? So there are 11 justices of the court. Each judge has approximately two clerks. The chief justice and the deputy chief justice have three clerks and all of the justices have their discretion to appoint foreign clerks in addition to the two local clerks. So doing the maths, that would be 25 um, local clerks, I believe, mm -hmm. and then discretionary uh, appointments of foreign clerks. Um, so that brings us to the end of today's recruitment session. We hope you all found it useful in some respect and your questions were answered. Um, <clears throat> I would encourage you to watch back the video if um, you weren't able to watch it from the beginning and explore the Constitutional Court website for more information about the law clerkship and the opportunities to the opportunities which come after the clerkship to study abroad. Um, and there will be a second recruitment um, live stream hosted on YouTube. Um, so just look out for information regarding that session. And perhaps if you weren't able to ask a question or if your question wasn't answered in today's session, you can um, use that avenue. But otherwise, thank you all for joining us. Um, we wish you all the best of luck in your application process. We hope that you're inspired to apply and you put your best foot forward in the application process and you don't face any challenges during that process. And if you are 36, please apply. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> you can't apply. Um, so yeah, thank yeah. you, everyone. I hope you have an enjoyable evening further. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.